I was 22 years old, that's me on the left, working as a clerk typist at Harvard University. It was my first job out of college. And a group of us started sitting around on our lunch hour and talking about our jobs, low pay, unequal pay, training men to be our own supervisors, having to do favors, all kinds of favors for our bosses, the lack of respect. As one woman put it, they call us girls until the day we retire without pension. And I think it all hit home for us one day when a student walked into the office, looked one of us straight in the eye and said, isn't anybody here? Well, I'm here, can't you see me? At that time, when people thought worker, they tended to picture a man in a hard hat wielding a wrench. Women workers, especially office workers, were virtually invisible. But in the, early, in the 1970s, millions of women were pouring into the workforce, and one in three was an office worker. And as the clerical workforce grew by leaps and bounds, so did a sense of injustice among the women whose job it was to type and file and mimeograph and photocopy. We wanted our rights and we wanted respect. Our goal was not just to get women out of the typing pool, but to make the typing pool a better place to work. As Elise Bryant, the director of the Coalition of Labor Union Women says, there are no menial jobs, just menial pay. We were keenly aware of that chain of working women's activism that stretched back to the garment women of the turn of the century who went on strike by the tens of thousands and galvanized the labor movement of their day. The brave women who supported the sit down strikers in the auto and steel industries of the 1930s and 40s and on up through the civil rights marchers of the 50s and 60s and the pioneers of the women's liberation movement whose ideas had seeped into every corner of American society. Maybe we thought, maybe now it's our turn. Maybe we could change the modern office, change the labor movement, change the world. We thought big. But women who worked in offices were scared to take action, and rightfully so. In the downtown office workforce, there was little or no history of collective action. When you had a problem, you tended to think of it as an individual personal problem. Maybe you should dress better or take a class. For most office workers, the very idea of sitting down across the table with management and negotiating over wages and benefits was unimaginable. And employers, of course, were intent on keeping it that way. The working conditions were very authoritarian. You could not leave your cubicle and go across the room to talk to somebody without your supervisor noticing. And when we handed out our leaflets at the big skyscrapers, inside the revolving doors, there were supervisors standing there waiting to snatch the leaflets out of workers' hands. So how are we gonna get off the ground? Well, we started small. We started with lunch. We called up all the women who had responded to our newsletter by like sending in their names, and we invited them to lunch one by one at a little downtown diner. Sometimes I ate three lunches in one day. And that's how I learned a very important principle of organizing, which is never bring an artichoke to a recruitment lunch. The heart of every lunch was listening, listening to what our lunch mates were concerned about, how they spoke, the words they used. Many women told us point blank that they did not consider themselves feminists. Well, okay, we could live with that. We didn't let vocabulary get in the way of solidarity. We met all kinds of women. Some wanted to be up there at the podium. Other people, their hearts started pounding when it was time to go around the room and introduce themselves. But we needed everybody because a movement needs all kinds of people. So we created roles in our organization for all kinds of people, the bold, the shy, and everyone in between. And it wasn't long before we called our first public meeting and our organization took off. We took over National Secretaries Week, the last week in April, which has been designated as a time for bosses to present their secretaries with a box of chocolates or a bouquet of flowers for their gratitude for a year of hard work but we wanted our rights 365 days a year. So we announced we were holding a bad boss contest and we invited office workers to nominate their bosses and entries poured in unbelievable stories. And the TV cameras rolled as we confronted the boss who had asked his secretary to sew up a hole of an in, in his trousers while he was wearing them. And the lawyer who fired his secretary for bringing him a sandwich on corned beef, a corned beef sandwich on white bread instead of rye. We called out the boss who handed his secretary a suspicious package saying, 
this might be a letter bomb. And you know his next words, of course, you open it. So as I speak about my book this year, I've been continuing this tradition by inviting people to submit the worst thing a boss ever asked them to do. And you're welcome to put yours on the chat. And here's some recent entries. Every Friday, all the women had to line up and kiss the boss to get their paychecks. I was ordered to bribe a prison warden. I was ordered to drive my boss across town and wait in the car while she attended a yoga class. I was required to accept a potted plant instead of a higher paying job, which I was told had to go to a man. And also there was the woman whose entry read, Ed Asner pinched my ass. Now the expression sexual harassment had not yet been coined, but that didn't mean it wasn't happening. We believed that the more women joined together for dignity and equality at the workplace, the less sexual harassment would take place. And the guidelines we created for employers, for women workers, for their male coworkers, helped pave the way for the Me Too movement. Basically, we perfected the art of raising a ruckus. You couldn't avoid us. I think the way some bosses saw it was that the wallpaper had come alive and things began to change. Countless bosses began getting their own coffee. We heard about a group of women at a tiny insurance company who drew up a long list of demands, including a raise, and they started circulating a petition. After three days, their boss caught them at it and he held up the petition for everyone to see. He held it over a trash can. He said, you know what we do with these things? They go straight in the trash, plunk. Three days later, all their demands were met. Soon we were taking on the biggest and the baddest corporate titans and driving them mad. We took on the biggest bank in town, the First National Bank of Boston. We declared 1979 the year of the first and the bank immediately announced they were instituting job posting, our first demand. And by the end of the year of the first, we had won promotions, career ladders, a grievance procedure, and the biggest raise in bank history. We announced our next target, the biggest insurance company, the John Hancock. And that night, one particular executive decided he'd better spend all night in his office just in case. In case what? I don't know. In case we invaded, I suppose. We did not invade but it wasn't long before the company announced a huge raise. And for the first time ever, they allocated $100,000 for employee childcare. Across the city, we ended up winning millions of dollars in back pay and raises. And I can't tell you how exciting it was. Actually, my book does tell you how exciting it was. It was really exciting. Women all over the country had the same problems and the same dreams. We formed a national association with members in every state and chapters in dozens of cities. And we made a point of targeting cities with diverse workforces in order to build a multiracial organization. Baltimore, Cleveland, Atlanta. We placed a priority on building a diverse membership, leadership and staff that would reflect the makeup of the clerical workforce itself. And that's something that didn't just happen. It took conscious work and it's something I'm very proud of. The movie, Jane Fonda knew one of us from the anti-war movement. And she came to us and said she wanted to make a movie about the concerns of office workers. Needless to say, we were thrilled. She brought her team to meet with our members and they popped a question that we had never thought to ask in all those recruitment lunches, which was, have you ever fantasized about doing in your boss? So there's a moment of stunned silence and then the room just exploded because it turned out everybody had. One woman said she fantasized about grinding up her boss in the coffee grinder. Another fantasized about swiveling her boss around in his swivel chair and swiveling him right out the window. All those fantasies went right into the script. And the movie Nine to Five was a comedy, but it told the truth. In the movie, as you may know, three women get together and it becomes necessary for them to kidnap their boss who the New York Times film critic described as a fine lunatic villain, a mini-brained tomcat. But once he's gone, the funny thing is that no one really notices. The three women quickly institute a whole slew of worker-friendly policies like flex time and job sharing and on-site childcare center and come to find out the company runs better than it ever did. The movie was a huge box office success in 1980. Women office workers had never seen ourselves as the main characters on the big screen, and the atmosphere in the theaters was electric. There's one scene where 
Jane Fonda on her first day is issued into this room with a large photocopy machine. And she like tentatively presses a button and papers start flying out of various orifices. And she's like frantically trying to pick them up and her lip is starting to tremble. And women would stand up in the theater and say, push the stop button. Dolly Parton's toe tapping anthem said it all. And Jane Fonda was a fantastic partner who spoke to working women gatherings all over the country. Here she is speaking to our members in LA right after the film production wrapped. Here she is passing out leaflets with one of our organizers. In the New York Times, urging office workers to organize. And here she is this year on the picket line with the Hollywood screenwriters because she never stopped. It was our movie movement that inspired the movie. And the movie in turn gave our movement a huge boost. After that movie came out, we had won the debate. Now it was time to consolidate our power. And that meant a union because only through a union contract do you get it in writing, guaranteed. Workers in unions earn higher pay, have better benefits, and they have a say over their working conditions. So in 1981, the Service Employees International Union, SEIU, granted us a nationwide charter, and our woman-led union, District 925, got off the ground all over the country. Not just SEIU, but other unions invested new resources in organizing women workers, and they discovered, none of you are going to be surprised, that union drives in woman-dominated workplaces, especially those with Black women, were more likely to succeed. And that was a surprise to those who early on told us, forget it, women can't be organized. They could be, and they were. Just like every union in the 1980s and beyond, though, we encountered ferocious opposition. Employers tried every trick in the book, legal and illegal. In response, we were forced to come up with some clever tactics of our own. At the University of Washington in Seattle, what turned out to work was making Tampax machines a major issue at the bargaining table. Yes, we did want more Tampax machines at the work site, but the real reason we kept talking about Tampax was that every time we used the word Tampax, the management negotiators got so flustered that some of them had to leave the room and we won a great contract. So what has changed and what remains to be done? Issues that used to be considered individual matters are now matters of policy, government policy, corporate policy, union policy. Pregnancy discrimination is illegal today. Sexual harassment is illegal. We have the Family and Medical Leave Act. We don't have help wanted male and help wanted female ads in the newspapers anymore. Managerial jobs are increasingly open to college educated women. But as we know, it can be harder to be a worker today than it was 50 years ago. Low paying dead end jobs are still with us and women and people of color are most likely to remain stuck in those jobs. Some people are working two or three jobs just to put food on the table. The gender gap in pay is stuck at 82% and much worse for women of color. The good news is the new wave of organizing is in full swing. Support for unions is at its highest level in two generations. 71% of Americans now support unions and 88% of young people. We're hearing new voices and seeing new tactics. The barbecues run by the Amazon workers, the sip-ins at Starbucks, one fair wage for tip workers, the National Domestic Workers Alliance, nine to five is still reaching out to women in every state and Postcard writing is at an all time high. These are the people, people like you, who are forging today's links in the chain of worker activism. These are the people, you are the people who give me hope for the future. So in conclusion, while I was doing the research for my book, I opened a box of old papers and I found this little quote that I had clipped out of a magazine. And it said, through our great good fortune, in our youth, we were touched with fire. And that's what it was like for me and for so many of us in the working women's movement. If you want to know more, and if you're looking for a dose of inspiration or a gift idea, you can find my book wherever books are sold. You can use the code WORKING25 for a 25% discount. I look forward to your questions and comments. 
Um, but before I, I close, I just want to quote from an old labor song that I love. And it says this, freedom, freedom is a hard one thing. You've got to work for it, fight for it, day and night for it. And every generation's got to win it again. So onward, let's go out and win it. Thank you. Wow, Ellen, that was phenomenal. Thank you so much for such a beautiful and um, moving um, history of nine to five and how it's impacted so many generations and how we are all still doing the good fight, even though we've had some wins, we've got so much um, further to go. And I really want to um, start our conversation before we get into the chat. I want to have a few questions with you before we dive into the chat questions. Um, you talked about the quote around um, touched with fire. And it reminds me of the quote by Ella Baker and those, um, you know, give people light and they will find the way. And so I feel like it's, it's similar in that way. And I feel like as a young person, when I started organizing in Chicago um, around workers' rights or around reproductive freedom, um, I was touched by fire and I was wanting to give light to folks. And so I think that that is what drives folks who work at Red Wine and Blue and everybody who's a part of our community because we have a fire building in us and we won't squelch it. We really want to make sure that we ignite it in others and even the fact that you um, talked about folks are doing postcard campaigns and we are launching our postcard campaign through um, our Rally Your Squad um, campaign this cycle. And we are so excited about it. And um, I really just wanted to lift up that quote very um, seriously. But I also want to just kind of go back to something you said earlier in the conversation about you had to kiss the boss. You, you <laughs> really had to kiss their boss before they got their paycheck. Like, what was that like? Like, what kind of feelings did you all share about that in the lunchroom? About like, oh, later this afternoon we're getting get paid and we got to kiss the boss. Like, what were you all feeling? Because in the se essentially that's sexual assault. That is sexual abuse in the workplace. And so, how did you all manage? to stand in that line and do that. Yeah, this was something that somebody said um, when I, you know, during this past year, when I've been uh, asking people to give me their examples of the worst thing that a boss ever asked to do. So it didn't happen to me, but some awful things did happen to me. And, you know, I don't know if people remember, but we just took it back then. Um, a lot of people, I mean, there was worse. People were raped by their boss. You know, people were raped and then fired by their boss. It was it was bad. And those things I'm sure are still happening. And the difference is that it's illegal today. And I think there's more consciousness about that now than there used to be. But, you know, a lot of what we were trying to do was to have people look around at each other and say, did you just say that? Do you Are you feeling what I'm feeling? And there was this sort of underground rumbling in the office workforce that was just starting. And we captured that and we gave people an outlet for how to deal with it. And, you know, that boss uh, who had asked the secretary to sew up a hole in his pants, you know, it was people who didn't work for that boss who came on their lunch hour and got the TV cameras rolling and called that boss out. So people were able to go to like the bank next door to their bank, not their own bank. And, and we invented all these safe ways for people to take action. Thank you so much for sharing that. I know that um, I definitely want to issue a content warning to folks because this can be emotionally charging this conversation, even talking about these topics. So I definitely, um, I apologize that I didn't um, do a content warning at the beginning because we will be talking about some hard topics and that folks are still processing some of the things that they may or may not currently be going through. Um, I think that something else is that um, you all started, nine to five started in 1973 and mm -hmm. in 1974, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act was enacted. And so until that point, women couldn't effectively have bank accounts on their own unless they were independently wealthy. And so that was less than, I mean, I mean, we're talking about 50 years, really effectively 50 years. 
and the fact that you all were able to accomplish so much um, in the beginning of your organization. Um, I want to just even just highlight um, a few things that you all did. Um, you all contributed to passing policies with the 1978 Pregnancy Discrimination Act, um, the 1991 Civil Rights Act, the Family Medical Leave Act, and the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. And I was able um, to meet Lilly in Chicago right after that happened. And so um, I, I just think that it's just so significant the strides your organization has made to make sure that working women, no matter where they are in an organizational structure, can have fairness, equity, and rights on the job. And so um, thank you so much for your leadership on that. And so um, I, I want to get to uh, the question that Jane Fonda posed to you all before the uh, movie. And she says, have you ever fantasized about doing in your boss? And I've never fantasized about that. Um, I, I think that the word boss is loaded. Um, and so I'd like to talk to you about the word boss. Why Why weren't you all calling your superiors uh, managers? Why were you always going to like the boss language? Um, I would like to interrogate that a little further. Well, you sound as if you would have been a very good organizer in our organization because we paid such close attention to words like that. Was it a boss? Was it a superior? Was it a supervisor? Was it a manager? Was it management? Was it the system? Was it the man? Um, and we we just, we kept listening to how people were talking about that. Some people used the word boss. Some people didn't. Um, the word worker, we thought was like, that was pretty standard, but people tended to say employee. And there were people who did not want to say needing. I was organizing some women in the publishing industries who preferred to call our get-togethers gatherings because it sounded less confrontational. So, but those people, those same people who didn't want to use the word meeting, it wasn't long before they were filing this huge lawsuit with the attorney general of Massachusetts. And they really stepped out and they were so bold and so brave and they knew what they were doing. They knew that it was really important to use words well and to not uh, alienate people by pushing them too fast, too far. Um, that makes sense. And I think that um, in the, I, I wasn't a union organizer, although I did work for the AFL-CIO, I was working um, for labor endorsed candidates. So there were already people we had already considered good guys or good folks or progressives. And mm -hmm. so um, we had the language to kind of do that, but I didn't organize in a workplace. And so what was it like organizing a workplace? Because you do have to do things shrouded in mystery. You can't do things on company time. You have to be very strategic about how you engage folks. And so what was that process like for you all in nine to five? Yeah, that's one of the things that is so unfair is that um, the, the employer, the boss, the manager is allowed to hold these captive audience meetings in most states where you know workers are required to attend these meetings to learn why a union is not the right thing for them on company time. And yet, the union organizer is not allowed to set foot at the workplace. So yes, it took a lot of subterfuge and it took really, I think what it really took was again, listening and just making sure that you talk to every single person, not once, not twice, three times, four times. And I just wanna mention in this uh, regard that um, we were very uh, tuned in to the, the demographics of any workplace we were organizing. So we knew that we had to reach everybody. And uh, that meant sometimes, you know, workplaces can be racially mixed more than neighborhoods can sometimes. And so it was, a, it was actually a wonderful experience for many of us to uh, find ourselves like serving on the organizing committee with people of different races and different backgrounds, different ages. And we always tried to pair like a black organizer and a white organizer. And when we sometimes got pushback, racist pushback, we did not pull that black person out of that workplace. We let that person know that she had our back. And um, yeah, and we that was a way to really make progress. And that was something that, again, I feel very proud that we did that and it paid off at the ballot box. Absolutely. And I think that's something that's very significant about 
the work that you all have done is that I saw in um, 2022, you all issued a report about the disparities between working folks and elected officials, particularly Black folks in Georgia. And you all issued a very comprehensive report about um, the disparities. And so can you tell us a little bit about why you all thought to look at Georgia and the disparities between elected officials and Black folks um, in particular? Yeah, Georgia, um, you know, as I said, it was very important to us to build a multiracial organization. And we'd started in Boston, which at that time, I think more than 90% of the workforce in the downtown workforce was white. And it was at that time, and still isn't particularly a very racially mixed city. Um, and we knew that the clerical workforce as a whole across the country was not all white. And so we we targeted these cities like First it was Baltimore, then it was Cleveland, and eventually Atlanta was one of the main places we went. And um, our organization, Atlanta, really took off, and we had some really great organizing experiences there. And, you know, Atlanta is kind of the pearl of the South, and uh, so it was a very important place to, uh, to organize and to bring people together. Awesome. And so you all have had a trajectory of an organization that's almost 50 years old. And so at what point did you all have a turning point where you were like, oh, we really want to incorporate diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and justice in um, our staffing, but also our, in our internal policies, both, um, yeah, internal, but then also have this outward facing we live our values, we walk the walk and talk the talk. Like at what point in your trajectory did you have that? Um, well, really from the very beginning, I think. Um, but it, it took us a few years to understand that, you know, Boston is not really representative of the whole country. And so that's when in around 1975 was when we started to expand out. So it was a couple of years after we got going. Um, and that whole that whole ethos of diversity in race, in class, in age was absolutely key to our organization and, and why it worked. Awesome. And I definitely see that your staff is uh, multi-generational and multi-racial. And so um, it's definitely commendable that you all have had a commitment for this long and are walking the walk and talking the talk both internally and externally. And so um, thank you so much for shepherding that. And so I'm going to turn the scales a little bit to the movie a little bit. Um, what was your involvement with the movie like? What was your involvement with the song? Like, I know that like Helen Reddy's I'm a Woman it was out. And then we had Dolly Parton doing the thing. And I'm a Tennessean. I've been to uh, Dollywood on several occasions. And so I'm a fan. And we're all fans. I I'm probably going to be Dolly this Halloween because I'm going to be going Halloween Palooza with my daughter at the zoo and trick-or-treating. And so I think it would be Dolly um, this uh, Halloween. But like, how did, like, the fanfare came in because you all started in 73 and the movie was in 80. So there was like a very quick trajectory from like, these women are organizing to, oh, we need to put them in the limelight and let America know that this is what's happening. And though it was comical, it still was part of, the the zeitgeist of what was happening in working conditions and workplaces all over America. Yeah, uh, well, as I said, Jane Fonda met one of our uh, leaders, Karen Nussbaum, in the anti-war movement, and they stayed in touch, and Karen kept Jane up to date. She knew all about the guy with the pants being sewn while he was wearing them and the corned beef sandwich, the whole thing. And she had started a production company that was committed to socially conscious films. And she made the, the film, The China Syndrome about nuclear power and uh, uh, the uh, film about uh, the, the returning Vietnam veteran. And uh, so she was sort of looking around and, but I think it took a really special person to think office workers are going to be are a cause, you know, and we were very nervous when she started making the movie and she hired a screenwriter and a whole production team. And we thought the whole thing was going to like slide out of our control and it was going to end up making fun of office workers. 
And it did not. Um, we actually, we were so nervous that we asked Jane if we could station a member of ours on the set to keep an eye on things and make sure nothing went off the rails. And so not only did that person move from Boston to LA and go to the set every single day, but Jane Fonda allowed this woman, Janice, to live in her house for several months <laughs> during the filming. And uh, Janice, you know, she caught certain things. Like at one point, the the characters line up for lunch in the in the company cafeteria, and they're ordering avocado sandwiches. Well, back then, 1980, maybe in California, you could order an avocado yeah, sandwich, right. yeah. <laughs> not, not anywhere else. So that was the sort of little <laughs> thing that she was catching. But we were absolutely thrilled that. The film did not make fun of office workers. It took those stereotypes of, you know, the bimbo, the, the empty headed secretary, the uh, the secretary who's in love with her boss. And it turned those things on their head. And it made you realize how ridiculous the boss was, the manager, the employer. And, uh, you know, and those women in the film, they they come out on top through collective action, through working together. And you could not have hope for more. You know, we were we were very earnest. We were a little upset when it turned out it was going to be a comedy. We didn't know that that was going to be right, but it was exactly right. And um, so if you haven't seen the film, it it really, it's very funny. No, it's good. No, I got it. And actually, I, I did want to, like, if we had time, I was going to, like, show the trailer or something. Maybe I should have did that and, like, maybe I can send that in the um, follow-up to the participants who registered today. And then also the details about getting your book. And so just to turn a little bit, just to kind of pivot a bit, um, your book is so profound and chock full of, it's an organizer's guide. Like you said, you, you set out for it to be an organizing guide. And I've read so many organizing guides, um, particularly, you know, by Saul Alinsky or, you know, I've read all the Harold Washington stuff where I've read the Ella Baker stuff and, um, I, I've read so many things, but this is the most relatable and down to earth organizing guide that you can read um, in a day or two. I'm a fast reader, so yeah, I can. Yeah, it's I, I, I can read pretty fast. That was my goal. I wanted to write a book that where I sort of slip in this organizing lore and wisdom in the middle of what's actually a story, a personal story. And, you know, and I wanted it to go down easy and uh, have people just be able to, you know, feel like, OK, uh, what's going to happen next? And um, and I think it does that both for young people and older people. Um, and so I'm glad that that you found it an easy read and a interesting educational read as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I learned so much about myself. And I think that the part that I really um, think is really profound is about the part about like, you really have to interrogate yourself. You have to like know <laughs> your moral compass and your values and what you will and will not speak up when choosing your battles and understanding that um, ego will come up and all those things. And so um, I'm so grateful that you um have created this very impactful text and so i, I don't want to um i want to make sure we have time for other questions but i have one more question because you start out the presentation about it was about it seemed like it was about individual issues at first like it was like we were all just in silos having these individual experiences but we re realized that it was collective and that it was about the culture of the organization you were in and that the toxicity was something that you all had to address and you all made a way and a path to be able to address it, even if it was in the shadows or in between lunch breaks or going to the water cooler. And so what would you say would be your um, advice about dealing with what we would call, you know, individual issues in the workplace now? Yeah, well, you really put your finger on it because I think in our society, we do tend to think of things in an individual way, a personal way. You know, it's my fault or how can I solve this? And I'm, I'm a wimp if I have to use somebody else's help to get something done. And it, it takes a lot to undo that and to start looking around and saying, actually, you know, 
an individual can make a difference, but individuals working together can make a bigger difference. And I think what's so exciting about your organization is that you've got that, you know, you, you grabbed hold of something that was really out there in society, the need for people to come together, see each other. Um, if they can't be in the same room together because there's a pandemic, okay, we can find other ways around that. And it just makes such a huge difference. It's, it's just, you know, once you've tasted that, there's no going back. Absolutely. And community is so important. That's what we really are here to do at Red Wine and Blue is cultivate community and make sure that folks know that they're not just screaming into the void, that they're having the same experience as other folks. And then we can, um, I always say that we're, we're learning in public together. None of us knows all the things or all the remedies or all the right things, but we're learning in public together. And so um, that's what I'm proud about. What I do here at Red Wine and Blue is I am learning out loud and in public with folks and um, I'm, I'm not perfect or the expert. I know a little bit about a few things <laughs> and I will share them, um, but I definitely think that uh, you, you got the nail on the head is that it's not just an individual problem is that we have to think about the collective impact of what we're all experiencing and educate one another and take collective action. And so we do have a few questions from the chat. I wanted to just, I'm going to share my screen really fast. I just want to know or tell you, Ellen, how much um, what you have done and what your group has done has affected women all over and that you didn't even know. I was 15 when the movie came out. Um, but a couple of years ago, I finally, um, in my being over 50, um, getting a, a promotion and my boss took a picture of me the day that I was promoted. And then this is, oh, wow, <laughs> this is the collage of that. And so I just, I, that has just always been a thing. You know, we have kind of laughed and joked about it in my office space. Um, very proud. I finally, I finally was able to, you know, make it. And so this morning when I was driving into work, cause I have an hour drive into work, um, the nine to five song actually came on and I was just so excited about tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> we did have a couple of questions in the, in the chat. Um, the first one that we got was how do women today combat gender pay gaps in the digital divide? Um, and I know that that is something that is, you know, still a concern in like the corporate arena. I actually work in government, so it's a little bit different, but it is um, something that is still going on in the corporate structures. We still don't have that um, that equity really um, across the gap, yeah. whether you're talking about just women in general or women of color, you know, we still have big challenges there. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what is meant by the digital divide does that mean that people who work digitally it could be that not, well, i'm not sure because i didn't this is not my question um what that person meant if they want to um come off mute really quick and kind of clarify um, yeah i can do that because i asked it um <laughs> um what that means is that now you've got so many businesses going remotely mm -hmm. and you know because of you, the divide was already an issue with the the prejudices against women who were working mothers who you know and we've always been at a disadvantage because you know women come with this you know extra oh well you know she's you know she's an employee but you know especially if you're a parent um all of those things but now we've moved into more of a from especially since the pandemic a remote um the the options for remote work have increased but the pay gap has not diminished i see what you're saying yeah yes absolutely first of all i want to say that uh the way our country treats working parents is a crime it's unbelievable no other industrialized country is like this it's it's incredible the pressures that working parents are under and how the system does not give, how rigid it is. 
Uh, it just should not be. And so many people of all ages are suffering from that. It's truly, it's truly a crime. Um, I think that uh, remote work has benefited some people in some ways, including working parents. And it's also been, put a lot of pressure on people in other ways. So, you know, it's great to not have to drive an hour to get home to your kids and have them have to go to after school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, you know, very difficult to be trying to work while toddlers are crawling under your feet and so on. So um, I think the main thing I want to say about this is that when we got started, we were 22 years old. We didn't know what we were doing, but nobody else knew either. And I feel really confident that today's generation is going to figure out the answers to today's problems. So I don't know what to do about remote work. I listened to some very smart organizers at a recent union convention who sat up on the stage and shared their stories of how they had uh, how they'd organized during the pandemic, how they had organized across this this terrible problem of not being able to get people together in the same room, not being able to look each other face to face in the flesh. Uh, mm -hmm. But they did it, you know. And I think that there are all kinds of things that are coming up now that we didn't have to confront. But on the other hand, we were confronting things that generations before us hadn't confronted. So we figured out answers to things like the guy with this was sewing up his pants and stuff that that people had not had to deal with before. And I feel really sure that today's organizers are going to find the answers just as we began finding answers for ourselves. Yeah, I know I was at Congressional Black Caucus last week or two weeks ago and the um, ladies who are um, in home workers, you know, domestic workers are mm -hmm. organizing and the ladies who do child care are organizing and these were primarily you know women of color in both of these discussions and it was amazing to hear them talk and they're like you know you can't go to work if you don't have child care <laughs> and so you know it was just it was really interesting and i guess to me just in listening to you talk that this was kind of like the you know because of what you did then they're now able to do what they're doing and you're right that at some point that these things are going to kind of come together um one of the, the the next question that someone had in the chat was how do we normalize talking about compensation? Um, and I know I'm an HR director in the daytime. So I know that that is something that, you know, we actually encourage, you know, folks to do and even to ask in um, the uh, interview setting. Um, we're kind of fixed though, because we're stuck with a budget because it's government, but um, we do kind of try to encourage people to do that, but you know, how do you, how do we normalize that, you know, and out in the um, uh, private sector? Yeah, very good point. Um, I remember that back in the day, uh, one of our leaders got together the women from her workplace, and she sat them all down, and she said, "Okay, everybody's going to have to either tell your salary or your weight." Ooh. And everyone laughed, but they started talking about their salaries and they people who thought they were getting a special deal found out that somebody else was making more and they'd all been told they were getting a special deal. Mm -hmm. um, and it really opened things up. But there is this, especially in the private sector, sometimes you're not allowed to talk about what your salary is, um, which, you know, that's got to be illegal <laughs> to prevent somebody from doing that. Um, yeah, it's it's, you know, it's a matter of of realizing who should be ashamed that I'm not making more money. Is it me or is it my employer? I, I agree with you, you know, and I also think that this is there, there's a difference in gender, you know, when you kind of look at this because men don't have a lot of trouble talking about a lot of the things that, you know, we women still are kind of a little reticent to do. You know, they talk about their salaries, they talk about, you know, their positions and what they're doing and they have and they have no problem not having but like one little iota of of uh, the the things that are being asked for in a job description and applying for that job, <laughs> you know, where we want to th think that we need seven or eight things over top of what the job description asks for before we even apply for it. So I think that that those are kinds of things that we just kind of we just got to plow through and do, you know, and I think that it's getting better, but I still think that we still have some room to grow. Let's lift up some good stories. Like, does anybody want to like, Ellen, do you have a good story about a good manager you had um, in your background? 
Yeah, well, the way I'd go at this is to is that um, it was very important for our to sort of uh, take the clothes off, you know, to say the emperor has no clothes, you know, right. to say that um, here are things that we all see that shouldn't be happening. And we we take pride in ourselves. We deserve better. And we're going to get together and ask for it. And then we had a very specific bill of rights for women office workers that detailed what every boss should be doing. And we distributed that all over the city. And there were there were employers who took those things very, very seriously and looked through all those 13 things and said, am I doing that? Am I doing that? Am I doing that? And, you know, we applauded that that spirit. Um, but it, it also, it just helped to get people out of this kind of timidity to say, all right, let's poke some fun at some of these people and let's call out some of this bad boss behavior. You know, one of the things we were able to do was to have women uh, serve as kind of whistleblowers where there was actually, there was an organization that was operating secretly in Boston called the Boston Survey Group where all the big employers got together and they decided what their wage scale was gonna be completely illegal. Eventually a lawsuit was filed and they had to stop doing it. But while that was happening, we we sort of chased them around the city. And the way we knew how to do that was that, you know, who types those agendas and sends out those memos about when the next meeting is? So women would anonymously send us, okay, here's where the next meeting is going to be. And then we'd show up and we knew exactly who was going to be there and what time and all that. And it was you know, it was very important to, and those people who gave us that information, they kept their jobs. They didn't have, they didn't have to take a risk. You know, all they had to do was send that little information our way. And we, we invented all kinds of ways for people to, um, you know, I mentioned that people would go to the, the place down the street, the employer down the street and protest there, not at their own place. Um, we also had anonymous surveys that we passed out in front of the big banks and insurance companies, tell us what it's like to work here. And then we would make a leaflet and send that back to them and put it right out there so that other employees knew and the employer too knew. And it really, it made a big difference. And we we won millions of dollars in back pay and raises from, from doing just that, from being in their face and uh, safely and just being unavoidable. Oh, wow. And I definitely know that some organizations that are continuing to highlight not only bad bosses, but even good employers are the Coalition of Labor Union Women. So if folks aren't aware of Clue, they're really um, amazing. They're only active in certain cities where there's a lot of union participation. And I was very grateful to be a part of the Chicago chapter way back in the day. <laughs> and so I, I really want to... Um, thank you so much, Ellen, for being here today and sharing your lived experience and the experiences of so many others and other movements and being um, the fire and the light that we all <laughs> can look to to keep us trudging on the path towards, I, I call it towards like what Dr. King said, towards the arc of justice. Yeah. Well, I really want to thank all of you for everything that you're doing. I'm going to go read those those comments on the chat. And Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'll definitely send them to you as well. And if you also yeah. want um, us to send out any follow up um, materials, because I'll definitely send out the information about your book and we're listening to our bookshop. Um, we're updating our bookshop right now because we have lots of authors we want to highlight because it is Band Book Week and you're kicking off our programming for Band Book Week. Great. Have not yet been banned, but you know. No, you're not banned. No, you're not banned, but you support the ban. So I, you're with the ban. So um, yeah. I'm going to have to make sure I get you um, I'm with the ban t shirt. Uh, that's what I'm going to have to get you. I'm going to have to get okay. you. I love hearing from people. So if you want to get in touch with me, my website is ellencassidy.com. C A S S E D Y is how I spell my last name, ellencassidy.com. So I'd love to hear from any and all of you. Thank you so much, Ellen. It's been an immense pleasure and honor being in community with you today. And we are immensely grateful for your work, your text, your work on the movie that I know lots of us are going to be re-watching and I'm going to be Dolly Parton for Halloween. Great. Okay. And, um, Send yeah. me a picture. 
Oh, oh yeah, we'll definitely do a picture and I'll, I'll be having a band book in my hand probably with it. Um, and thank you all so much for being a part of the Red Wine and Blue community. We are immensely grateful for you to be here and we hope to see you all tomorrow at the inaugural launch of the Little Band Book Club and also Rally Your Squad. Not only are we celebrating band books, we really want to make sure that we get our folks out to vote. And there is a very intentional way we want to do that through relational organizing in our five target states. And we're going to be rallying for reproductive justice and freedom. We're rallying for making sure that our voices are heard and that we have representation that will um, effectively represent us. And so thank you all for this evening and have a good night.